Hello there and a very warm welcome to this debate on the skills crisis facing UK manufacturing. We're going to have a discussion with some key people in the sector in a moment and I'll introduce them uh, in a few seconds. But first, Johnny, Johnny Williamson, my co-presenter on the programme. I wonder, for the sake of the audience, could you just run through the recommendations that came out of our documentary, The Perfect Storm? Of course, Nick. Yeah, no problem. So our key recommendations for manufacturers were to undertake an in-depth talent assessment to identify what skills you have, what skills you're likely to need, and those employees in your organisation keen to progress into other or more senior roles. Um, develop a clear understanding of what T levels are and what they entail. Reach out to local schools and colleges to explore opportunities to promote the sector and to generally demonstrate a bolder ambition to grow your own. The recommendations for government and policymakers were to commit to implementing the apprenticeship reform recommendations provided by industry bodies, um, to begin a far-reaching comms campaign to ensure all employers and parents and young people are aware of T-levels and what they involve, and then identify and then implement measures to help ensure the UK skills landscape is better connected, funded and supported. And then a final recommendation for both manufacturers and government is to instigate an outward facing coordinated comms campaign, really aimed at selling the sector to parents, teachers and young people, but also those employed in other sectors. Brilliant. Thank you, Johnny. Um, right. Time to introduce our guests. Uh, I'm afraid to say that one of them, Gareth Jones of Income Training, was called away at the very last moment, literally just before we started recording. Um, so we'll talk to him separately and knit it in at the end of this discussion. Um, but I'm delighted to introduce Matt Ashworth, who's Director of Manufacturing at BAE Systems. Uh, BAE is set to hire more than two and a half thousand new apprentices and graduates in 2023 an outstanding contribution to the sector as a whole. And also, uh, welcome to Lee Howarth, uh, Business Development Manager at MCNC Precision Engineering in Bridgewater, Somerset. Anybody who watched the documentary would know that uh, uh, Lee's contribution was quite amazing. Um, it was very much around the festival of British engineering and manufacturing that he and his company staged over the last couple of years, an outstanding uh, example of what individual manufacturers can do to engage with young people in their local areas. A uh, great success story. You want to pick his brains about what he did, and maybe you can uh, pick up some tips from it. Matt at uh, BAE Systems, perhaps we can start for you. Um, BAE is an absolute sector leader when it comes to promoting apprenticeships. Indeed, you are an ex-apprentice yourself. Tell us about your commitment to apprenticeships. Is it historical? Is it something that's been going on for a long time? Or is this a new development in the company? So good, good morning, Nick. Uh, also delighted to, to be invited to this, uh, this conversation and discussion this morning. Um, Apprenticeships and early careers are, are almost the lifeblood of BAE Systems. Um, many of our senior leaders today um, started their careers as apprentices themselves, you know, craft apprentices or, or other apprentices through our, through our system. I, I myself was a craft apprentice that started at BAE Systems in 1992 and, um, and have moved through the organisation. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily a new thing, it's something we've always encouraged. Um, but I think it's diversified as we've as we've developed and, and progressed. Where we've opened it up to you know engineers rather than just craft apprentices. We've got business apprentices. Uh, we cater and tailor for all areas, including supply chain. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's a fairly long-standing and enduring um, process that we've used. But we definitely see it as the lifeblood of of our of bringing new people in and new diverse ideas. Um, Matt, I wonder. Um... You, you will have seen in the report this idea about a, a UCAS clearinghouse idea. So large organisations such as BAE Systems, they may advertise for, say, 200 apprentices. They may get applications from 500 people. Um, you'll take the 200 you select. What about the other maybe top 100, top 50? Um, what about helping place those within your supply chain and ensuring that that interest that those young people have expressed in manufacturing doesn't slip through the net. 
No, I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic idea. I mean, we have a, we have a heavy re- reliance on our local supply chain providers and and you know the, the the local community and the people working around it. So I think it's it's incumbent on us to not only pick the the the, the people that we want to think will be successful in BA systems, but also connect our suppliers and even through our enterprises on type of uh, uh, constructs, work out whether there's an opportunity to connect those people that are looking to come into manufacturing that might help s- uh, small, medium-sized enterprises that, that help us develop and, and produce our products. So I think it, it, it makes sense for us to try and do that the best way we can. It's all about integration. It's all about understanding people's local demand. Um, but again, I, I don't think there's, there's, there's anything wrong with the approach. I think it's just a case of communication and integration, really. If I can turn to Lee, um, Lee, you started the Festival of British Engineering and Manufacturing a couple of years ago in Bridgewater in Somerset. What was the incentive, the imperative behind that for your company? The lack of skill, uh, a skill set available within our geographical area is heavily impacted by the Hinkley Point construction facility um it's a massive drain on local resource for other businesses um even though we in 2018 mcnc won um the sme of the year for our apprenticeship programs anyway and we had specific growth plans to grow our business which obviously required more talented people whether they were experienced skill sets or bringing on board new talent and as you put earlier to grow our own. Um, The problem that we had in the local area was that manufacturing businesses were, the talent pool was was stagnating and individuals would just rotate around various companies. So if I needed to recruit a skilled five axis miller, another business is lost a five axis skilled miller. They then recruit and then this, we've just got this merry-go-round of talent. And it was during lockdown because of the demand for our services within the aerospace and defense sectors that we had a serious issue of not being able to fulfill the demand from our, our customer base they because of our skills and our quality and the way we we work what they were asking us to do more and more on a regular basis which is fantastic um, we had the investments for for new technology we had the investments for larger premises we had nobody to fill it and operate it. So it, it was during lockdown that it all came to a head, the very first lockdown in 2020. We were trying to um, recruit further apprentices. Lockdown happened. Um, we couldn't recruit. And I found myself on a similar forum like this at the beginning. And uh, I took a step back and looked at myself because I was coming more and more of a, a, a vocal Bob Geld off of just, and I found myself whinging and moaning and, banging the table and nothing doing it. And there was just a, a, not a eureka moment, but it was just a a tipping point was, right, we have to do something about this. How can we be different? How can we not only educate young people of the fantastic benefits of engineering and manufacturing as a career choice, but also to educate the educators? So we're trying to educate teachers, we're trying to educate uh, parents, and other businesses within the area of the multiple career paths within engineering. We're a CNC machining house. Um, However, we need metrology people, we need projects people, we need NPI engineers, we need um, management, we need business development. All across the, the various roles within manufacturing, we need it. So, having various conversations with our customers, our suppliers, and it soon became very clear and apparent that MCNC were not alone. So we decided to be very open, very transparent, and open our doors. And I invited every single school in the county, every technical college, uh, our key customers, our key suppliers, and I was amazed at the willingness of others to participate. So when you've got three competitive tooling companies all trying to sell us their widgets and to have them, three of them on site, side by side, and for the common good of UK manufacturing and telling students about their career paths, how they started, 
some were craft apprentices like myself on YTS schemes or other apprentice schemes and have just had a career pathway over the years. And to get them to engage with young people and say, look, it's not just dirty sparks and spanners. You can you start here and your career is like life. It's a journey. It, it's not about the start point. It's not necessarily about the destination. It, it is about the journey of how to get from A to B of where you need to go. So we had sports cars on display, jet powered surfboards, backpacks. We had uh, live scanning where we were scanning students' faces and hands. We had 3D printers on board uh, from and a, a science lab from Plymouth University. So the reason I try to do all this because I'm I'm dyslexic, slightly quirky, and I try to put myself in the shoes of a, a similar similar young person of 14, 15, 16 years of age. If I bring them into my factory, show them a CNC machine, it's a white box, makes lots of noise, there's liquid and fluid going everywhere, you can't see inside. The machining process finishes, you open the door, you, you show somebody a widget, this fits on a sports car, so what? But if you could demonstrate see the car, see the processes of how this widget and what it actually does on the sports car of the journey of that component and all the multiple skill sets required to produce that part. It kind of opened young people's eyes as, as to what was actually out there. And more importantly, it is a well-paid and rewarding career, depending on where you want to go. So it was just a case of, look, teachers, students, parents, Engineering is no longer dark, dirty, grimy, sparks and spanners. It's high tech. It's full of IT. It's full of robots and automations, coding, work holding, everything you can think of. It's we demonstrated there. And it was a fantastic, amazing, an amazing event. And one of the, I've got to be honest, one of the highlights of my personal career in terms of a sense of achievement. Um, we had just under 400 students through the door on over two days and numerous lecturers, teachers and other professionals from academia. And in, I'm pleased to say it's starting to snowball and I'm, I'm still getting hits on my website from it now. Can we come to the next one? When is it going to be, etc. So hopefully um, it will be a good legacy and I want to share it. I want other companies and anybody can feel free to reach out to me and I will. It wasn't easy, but it wasn't as difficult as people might think to, to, to do. And the, the feedback from the community was fantastic. I wonder, Matt, that the, this changing face of, of manufacturing, as, as manufacturing becomes more digitalized and, and tech enabled, um, does that mean that manufacturers are now having to compete for talent with the likes of um, the video game market, um, Google, Amazon, the, the Facebooks and Netflix of this world. Um, and is that a, a help or a, or a hindrance? Um, I think it's both, um, if, if I'm honest. The, the facts are, yes, we are, we are competing. Um, but, but in the same breath, uh, as we move into more technological um, environments and more digital environments, we're actually doing quite a lot of work with Microsoft. We're doing quite a lot of work with gaming companies. You know, we're collaborating quite significantly um, with those those types of companies to actually evolve and develop what our manufacturing and, and our and our solutions are for the future. Not just manufacturing, but in terms of our maintenance and product product maintenance in the future. So, you know, a lot of it is around. Um, yes, there's always going to be a positive, a negative side to it because you're competing against you know other very compelling competitors. But there's also opportunity, I think. I'd also echo Lee, Lee's thoughts, though, in, in as much as, yes, the, the, the rate of technological evolution and advancement is significant. Um, yes, we are, we are competing with the Googles, the Microsofts and the gaming companies. But from a manufacturing perspective, um, the apprenticeship that I did <clears throat> in 1992 and the fundamental principles that Lee described is very similar to the apprenticeship that we deliver today. It's certainly in that, you know, foundational fundamentals of engineering and manufacturing, because without those, 
uh, I think we've got a major problem. So even today in our manufacturing uh, apprenticeships, many of the things we do is, is the bedrock of, of our apprenticeships start in exactly the same way as we did or I did in 1992 because they are fundamental. And without those, um, we're going we're to really struggle. So we clearly evolved that and we've progressed that and we developed that to make sure that we are bringing in new processes, new thinking, new technologies, new innovation, new applications. Um, but we've got to remember that there's a there's a foundational piece here um, that we that we need to maintain. Matt, if I can ask you to pick, you know, follow on from that, because listening to what Lee was saying about the the fact that the educational landscape chops and changes, there doesn't seem to be a real joined up thinking understanding at the education provider level. BAE Systems, of course, is massive and can run its own training. What would be on your wish list for um, the, the, the nation as a whole when it comes to how young people are educated um, through GCSEs, A-levels, T-levels? What would you change if you had the opportunity? I think, um, again, I think it goes back down to integration and I think, I think exposure. Um, I think it's, I think it is about educating the educator. I think I think Lee's point's right. I think there's a piece around, you know, for those for all of those teachers out there that say if you don't concentrate and work hard, you're going to end up in a factory. Um, how many of them have ever been in a factory? So I think there's a bit around how do we how do we help educate collectively? How do we how do we get um, the education systems to understand what is out there in industry and in manufacturing, and and you know the, the rate of like i said before the rate of manufacturing change the rate of technology change is moving so fast we probably can't expect them to keep up with us we i think we've got to do a better job of of selling what manufacturing is and keeping people informed of what manufacturing is and keep people informed of what we think we're going to need as a, as a sector and, and 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 educate those people i think um a bit of consistency would be good i think time would be good in terms of allowing our systems, these systems, whether it's T-level systems or otherwise, to bed in and allow not just big companies, but again, small, medium-sized enterprises, give them time to allow these processes to bed in and, and uh, you know, adjust where things might not be working, but give us some consistency to get a level of stability, I think. Um, you know, the T-levels, I think lots of industry and uh, groups have have been given the opportunity to advise and influence the outcome of what T levels might want to look like and how they should be shaped. I think we need to give it a chance. So we need to have a level of stability. I think to uh, to to go and deploy it and work out what's not quite working well enough, and then how do we uh, tailor it, and how do we how do we make sure that everybody's doing their part in that process rather than making wholesale changes. So I think you know. I think we've engaged with industry well. I think it's about stability. I think it's about consistency. And I think it's about subtle changes rather than wholesale changes. Is there anything more that the big OEMs like yourselves should be doing for the sector as a whole? Do you believe you're doing enough? I think we're, I think we're doing um, I think we're doing a lot. Like I said before, you know, in 2023, we'll, we'll recruit, you know, two and a half thousand apprentices, graduates, early careers. Um, I think... Um, we look to engage, as I said before, forums like the Northwest um, Manufacturing Forum. You know, we, we, we engage with all sorts of small and medium-sized enterprises to try and connect. There's all, always more we can do with um, schools and colleges. We, we reach out to schools and colleges uh, extensively. We have STEM ambassadors that go out to try and inspire and motivate um, and, you know, connect with schools and, and get school children and pupils. Um, there's always more we can do. It, again, it comes back down to um, communication and integration. It comes back down to what what is the need, what is the local, global uh, need of, of small, medium-sized uh, enterprises um, and, 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 that, and understanding that, again, they are supporters of what we do on a daily basis. Without them, um, we don't have a BAE system. You know, a, lot, a, a good section of our... Uh, of our physical manufacturing work is done outside of the main gates and BA systems. Yeah, and without them, without that supply chain, and without those um, skilled people in manufacturing and outside those main gates, um, we can't deliver what we need to deliver.
Um, and that, you know, and, and that doesn't mean um, we, we can't get them from elsewhere, from from you know, from different countries and from, from and import things. But it is about how do we? It's about UK PLC list. This is about UK manufacturing. So it's about how do we work more in, in a more integrated way, not just in manufacturing, but in, in supply chain, in procurement, and in engineering. How do we work in a more integrated way um, to make sure that we can deliver what needs to be delivered? What this what this is demonstrated as the report demonstrated was there is um, an appetite from from businesses. Um, a lot of businesses are involved in. Um, running their own initiatives, um, as 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 Lee and Matt have have said, but I suppose what's missing is 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 joining all these pockets of excellence up and filling in the gaps. It, it, it it's I don't think it's good enough to have um, one company doing it, but the one next door not, or, or or events happening in in one region but not happening in the regions surrounding it. This this postcode lottery of of activity and, and excellence needs to become more more uniform, um, and I suppose it's how do we enable that? How do we get that to happen um, sooner rather than later? Ideally, um, I, I suppose it comes back to a lack of um, an industrial strategy tied in with a strong skill strategy as well. Yeah, what struck me, I, I mentioned this uh, in social media after the report went out. During the report, one word kept coming up, culture. Uh, in the UK, we have a culture of not replacing machinery, letting them run on and on and on until they, they grow whiskers and die. Um, a, 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 a culture of uh, of not investing uh, for the future, a culture of going it alone. Um, or it's almost as a bit of I'm all right, Jack. As long as I'm okay, I don't really care about anybody else. What we've seen today and what we saw during the report are that there are some very bright silver linings in the dark clouds, but we don't need <laughs> the dark clouds are too many of them. We need more silver linings. And that's why I really support what you're saying, Johnny, about the need for a much more integrated um top down, bottom up, uh, and they'll meet in the middle uh, and, and magic will happen. Um, I'd like to offer Matt and Lee sort of the opportunities to sum up from what you've heard from each other today. Um, uh, Lee, perhaps you'd like to kick off. What's, what's your final thoughts, your final contribution to this conversation? This is about, let us not forget, how we're going to implement some of the recommendations that were made in the report. Fundamentally, I think we need to start with academia and, and government needs to start educating the educators. We need to change the way we measure the success of our students. It's not about bums on seats for 10 A-level, A-star plus students that's going to go and, and get hires at a university. Is Don't get me wrong, we need those bright academic people as well. But I think that to get people more interested, young people and more interested in math, science, English and math, uh, STEM, is we need to start at a primary age. Now, because of my condition, I was taught trigonometry, but it was taught in a way that had no applicable um, value to it. it. It was just an uninspiring teacher writing squiggles and numbers on the board, and it didn't mean anything. And 95% of my cl classmates back then thought, what a waste of time, we're never going to do that. But then as a 14-year-old tea boy in a factory, I overheard an engineer say, we need to trig that out. And when he explained to me why, it fell into place. Ah, that's why we do it. So we need practical tasks and activities for primary and junior school children to start steering them so they can understand why we need to use maths, why we need to use science, why we need to build um, crumple zones on a car to absorb forces it, and in a practical way by giving them an egg, some straws and say, right, slide this egg down the, a six foot plank of wood and whoever's egg doesn't break when it hits the end is wins a Mars bar or whatever it might be. We, we need some practical pure skills within it and then it, it will it will snowball um young people just don't realize what what is out there and technology is moving on and so far so quickly with vr and everything and i pick up on both your points johnny and matt is we, we need um we need 
our country of fantastic and amazing manufacturers of anything from sound systems to spacecraft to work together and have a synergy and a common goal of becoming making great britain great again at the, at the manufacturing and that level of respect that tool makers and engineers had back in the 40s the 50s and the 60s that is gone it's gone now so it, it's understanding what engineering is what manufacturing is and what people need to do it and more importantly it is a well-paid rewarding career and it can take you around the world um within your your role so there's there's something for everyone within manufacturing matt that uh, word collaboration um also ran like a, a seam of gold through our report um ba systems believes very strongly in collaboration um and i know from what you've been saying sum up for for us what you think the next steps must be for us to to capitalize on this new wave of understanding that we must do something about this skills crisis so i think collaboration is key it is key um i I think we do collaborate quite well i do i think we collaborate well and i've given you some some examples of that earlier um we we collaborate extensively with with um, catapult centers as an example so the amrc the advanced manufacturing research center there's one at salmsbury right next to our uh, manufacturing plant at salmsbury we 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 extensively work with them we work with the um northwest aerospace alliance which brings in again again local smaller smes and other big smes to uh, have a voice in what's going on in manufacturing in the in the northwest so i think we we can de- we demonstrate we're actually quite good at collaboration we've got to do more of it uh, and to lee's point we've got to be uh, unashamed and, and unafraid of collaborating and sharing our experiences and knowledge and that isn't necessarily about ip um, because some things can't be shared. Uh, that's about our experiences, and it's about our skills, and it's about how we get benefit for you get again the UK manufacturing domain. So, so I think we do it quite well. I think um, there's always room for improvement. I, I echo Lee's point around the need for going back into schools and colleges and targeting things at the right level and making manufacturing and engineering fun. Because if you, if you can make it fun you're going to attract people. I think there's definitely something in this about, you know, the language of manufacturing or what, what is manufacturing and what does it entail? I think there's a bit around trying to create a, a really clear talent pipeline and, and pathway through. Um, back to Lee's point about we recruit for, you know, 10A star GCSEs. Well, that's great. And we do need those types of people. We do need that level of intelligence. But we also need people that are going to go and work in manufacturing factories and facilities and stay in manufacturing facilities because that's what they're passionate, they're passionate about. Because if we're not careful, what we have is lots of smart people coming through that come into manufacturing and then leave manufacturing and go into other uh, neighbouring neighboring activities and, and engineering type like activities, which is good. But we need people in manufacturing and we need to retain people in manufacturing. So I think we collaborate well. There's more that we can do. Uh, there's more that big OEMs can do. Um, and I think the more we reach out and we connect and we come up with local ideas around how we can share ideas, how we can work collabor- collaboratively together on all of the th- things we've talked about, whether it's training, recruitment, retention, um, whatever it is, that, that's how we need to do it. We need to work it in collaboration and, and, um, uh, and collectively. Matt Ashworth, Director of Manufacturing at BAE Systems. Our thanks to him and to Lee Howarth from MCNC. Uh, That concludes the first part of the debate. Uh, As we said at the beginning, unfortunately, one of our participants was called away at the very last minute. Uh, So I'm going to hand over to Johnny to make the introduction and move on to that part of the discussion. So we're delighted today to be joined by Gareth Jones, the Managing Director at Incom Training one of the UK's leading providers of apprenticeships and training, rated by Ofsted as outstanding. Um, Gareth, Incom Training has teamed up with Brandauer um, to co-develop and co-write a syllabus to upskill Brandauer's existing engineers to be skilled toolmakers. Um, that sort of partnership, I'm sure, is going to be of interest to many manufacturers. Um, and if they wish to go down that route, um, they probably need to do it with their eyes open. So what exactly 
is involved in that sort of partnership and what should a manufacturer expect to have to provide in terms of um, resources, um, employees, time, money? Okay, so just to outline the project, the project isn't solely for Brandauer's use. It's actually for the whole of the tooling industry. So the project was born probably about 18 months ago where Brando was on a growth strategy for selling commercial tooling. Um, we all know about the reshoring and trying to bring UK manufacturing back, manufacturing back to the UK uh, and bring tools back in, into the UK, but there's a skill shortage. So um, we opened a commercial tool room, which was to aid Brando's growth and also was the unique offering of being able to deliver training on live tools right from design through to try out, which hasn't been done in the UK before. Um, to be fair to Brandauer, uh, from the manufacturing point of view, they've put their intellectual property on the line. We spent 12 months when there was two employees um, from the tooling industry, uh, now in the educational sector. They spent uh, 12 months inside Brandauer, literally extracting their intellectual property and putting it into modular courses, both practical and theory based. Um, obviously, that was sense checked by Brandauer, but Brandauer see the vision of wanting to create more tool makers with, within the UK because it is a dying art. So, um, yeah, there was uh, there was up to one million pound invested. We already had equipment in there, such as wire EDM, metrology measurement equipment, five axis CNCs. Um, Brandauer uh, brought over obviously their, their expertise, further CNC machines, grinders, etc. So the collaboration wasn't just uh, in terms of creating content to be able to deliver training, it was also on an equipment format. Um, we formed a strategic partnership with legal documents, there was also lease agreements having to be done in place and then we had to sign um, non-disclosure agreements as well for the intellectual property that, that, that was on show. And we've just had the first cohort start um, of five engineers, maintenance toolies that we're, we're developing into skilled tool makers and they're from Jaguar Land Rover, both from Solihull and Castle Bromwich. So we're really pleased to have the pilot now up and running and it's a full-time 20 week program. Um, so it is very immersive um obviously it, it, it's costly um but if, if your engineer follows that 20 weeks they're going to come out the other end a much more competent and skilled person in the tooling arena so yeah it's in, it's an intense project we all know about the skills gap that's later been exasperated by covid people retiring early on top of what we already had was a big skills gap but industry's got to play a part in it. And I've got a saying, it's about engaging the disengaged. There's a, there's a lot of engineering manufacturing companies do very well with educational pathways, whether that be higher education, apprenticeships. Um, but there's a lot of companies that actually don't, that they rely on other organizations to um, appease their problems, if you were, instead of taking action themselves. So, you know, we're really waving the flag of engaging with industry. That's where income was born and bred from firm foundations and relationships. So, yeah, we want to see industry getting in partnership more with training providers to develop niche curriculum and content. Gareth, if I can ask you, uh, income training very much focused in the West Midlands. How many companies are there like you uh, serving the manufacturing sector across the country? Because it feels like um, at the moment it's a bit of a postcode lottery. You're providing a Rolls Royce or should I say a Jaguar Land Rover level of service um, to the manufacturing sector. How many other companies are there like you doing what you do? In terms of the West Midlands, there's, there's in terms of private training provision, there's us and one other organization so when you think about it, there's only two private training providers in the west midlands providing engineering manufacturing training it, it, it's jaw-dropping really because with the epicenter really there's a massive cluster of engineering manufacturing within the west midlands and um private training provision there are colleges but it's it's not enough it's not enough for sure okay so let's imagine that you had a magic wand what would you do uh, to 
replicate yourself across the country? So when I built the growth strategy in 2015, it was about opening training facilities in partnership with industry, which we have done over a period of time. Um, we, we've created three training centers within Shropshire uh, and the West Midlands that are in partnership with industry. But obviously coming out of COVID, we are just in a stabilization period now. As um, soon as we can get through this year, we've been spending a lot of money in terms of digitizing the business for systems, processes, um, and once that's done, we would um, look then to go further afield across the UK and opening training centres in partnership with industry. But we, we, we perceive to be doing that through an acquisition basis. So, um, you know, we want to pick where the where the needs are. You know, you've got aerospace clusters, automotive clusters, uh, renewable clusters now all over the UK. Uh, so it's going to be sort of targeting them, doing our research, to ensure that the provision can be tailored for industry within that region. Obviously, engineering manufacturing is capital intensive. If you look at the apprenticeship section sector now as well, I think the apprenticeship reforms happened in around 2018, uh, 2017 with the trailblazers coming on board. Now, we, have, we haven't been given any more money since that point to deliver advanced engineering apprenticeships. So you can imagine the erosion on your margin year on year and how much more difficult it gets to be able to deliver good, wholesome quality curriculum and content. So there the, the needs to be more investment into quality training providers and provision from, from actually funding the programs, um, but also in terms of capital investment as well. Are you talking about the government getting more involved? And if so, what's a, a, a pretty much an ideal mix between private provision and government provision and financing for technical colleges, FE and so on? The education system at the moment is very complex. And for, a un, um, for an uneducated person in the sector, it's very difficult to find your way through what is perceived to be a quagmire of qualifications and funding offering across the UK. I mean, with devolution now in the West Midlands, we've got the West Midlands Combined Authority. That's sort of replacing the LEPs. Uh, the LEPs did a great job of identifying um, issues locally, so the funding could hit exactly where and what is needed. Um, but we need more of it. It needs to be more versatile, but it also needs to be more streamlined. You know, we've got T-levels coming out in engineering and manufacturing now. You, you've got apprenticeships, depending on where you are in the country or depending on what the qualifications are funded within that region. You've got A-levels, GCSEs, HNCs, degrees, degree apprenticeships. And, and they don't all entwine necessarily to give you a smooth uh, career development pathway from the offset. So, um, yeah, I'm not really sure the government should directly be getting involved, but definitely be working regionalised to understand where the issues are and, and putting the funding where it needs to be. Gareth, this idea of modular um, modular learning, um, bite-sized learning, was definitely a thread that ran through the report. And we know we've got a an evolving skills shortage as the the skills required changes uh, we also know that um, we need to focus much more on lifelong learning and learning continuously throughout our professional careers so do you see bite-sized learning and, and and chunking courses up into smaller smaller sections key to achieving those goals 100 percent, yeah and but they've got a, they've got each one of those chunks or the modular as we call them has got to have its own credibility to a, to a bigger umbrella, really. So if you go and so, for instance, if we deliver, if we develop a mechatronics apprenticeship, what we do is we take elements of that apprenticeship and the content and sell it commercially in modular size chunks, if you like. But you've got to be able to accredit those modular chunks. So, for instance, one year you may want to do something around level four. Uh, materials which might take you two months to achieve and then but then have a break in learning and then the year after maybe look at systems and processes and and do another so but you, it needs to be accredited you mentioned engaging the disengaged um, there's there's quite a sizable swathe of manufacturers that aren't engaging with this with this um, shortage 
it begs the question if the events of the last few years haven't forced them to engage, uh, what exactly will? <laughs> there is the million dollar question to be quite honest there's a lot of owner managed businesses and I can only speak for the West Midlands and Shropshire here there's a lot of owner managed businesses that are okay just doing what they're doing they've not necessarily got a growth strategy and I think that's an important thing we've got to try and create this stimulus to want organizations to grow um, so that's a mindset change. Um, that's a marketing piece, whether that's done through initiatives, incentives, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But we, there's a large manufacturing base that are quite comfortable where they are, should we say. Gareth Jones, thank you. Um, Johnny, from what you've heard from Matt Ashworth, Lee Howarth and Gareth Jones, is there anything that gives you confidence that the recommendations that you set out at the start of this program have the potential to see the light of day? I think so, Nick. I mean, we're putting together a picture of what the, the landscape could look like for, for manufacturing in the UK. Um, and it's all about joining up these programs, these initiatives, as, we, as we've heard in the report and this discussion today. Um, as always, it comes down to um, we need more engagement and a longer term strategy from from the government, not just one department. Skills touches every department. So I think Gareth was absolutely spot on in, in saying we need all of them around a table with academia, with manufacturing um, to really start moving this forward because there's great things happening, but we need to eliminate that postcode lottery, as you put it. OK, Johnny, thanks very much. Well, we called our documentary, our report, The Perfect Storm. It's more than clear that for the storm to abate, all elements of UK manufacturing, government to individual SMEs have a part to play in heading off the growing crisis we face from a shortage of skills. As ever, though, it's easy to identify what needs to be done, a heck of a lot harder to make it happen. But uh, not trying to do that is really not an option as ever. For Manufacturing TV and on behalf of Johnny Williamson, I'm Nick Peters. Thank you for watching. Music